So I heard a really nice comment in the elevator. I was riding up to my room because I'm checking out because I'm leaving um, right after this seminar uh, to go to Spain to speak at another conference <laughs> for one day. And then I get up at 4 in the morning to catch a 6 a.m. flight back to Napa because I got a meeting the next day in the office. Yeah. So I'm riding up in the elevator, and two people were talking, and one of them said, oh, we were in a session, and I'm not going to mention what session it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the session next door to us seemed like they were having a great time. <laughs> they were all laughing a lot. And I said, oh, good, that was my session. <laughs> so I think just to drive the point home, we should all just give a really good laugh to the people next door. Are you ready? <laughs> Beautiful. Now you can tell everybody else, oh, no, we were in that session. How many of you have been to Tuscany? Excellent. Which means I'm guessing that 75% of those, how many of you have been to San Gimignano? Yeah, it's the wonderful touristic, one of many wonderful touristic towns in Tuscany, famous for towers. the towers. It is, you can see in the slide, famous for, supposed to be the town of 100 towers. I don't know about you, I can count better than that. But anyway, does anyone know why they built all these towers? Who were they watching? Each other. Gotta love Italy. Right? How many different governments have they had since 1945? How many years have there been since 1945? <laughs> Not a coincidence. Yeah. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my belief that terroir is a load of crap. Okay, I'm ready. Come on. That wine is not so much an expression of geology and climate, it is more an expression of culture. <laughs> Take an Australian winemaker to Bordeaux and he will make wines that taste Australian. Take a French winemaker to California and suddenly the wines start changing. It's the same geology, it's the same climate. The only thing that's different are the people. So as my friend Warren Winiarski says, it's actually not terroir, it's really the three G's. The ground, the grapes, and the guys. <laughs> or in this case, the girls. So I think it's important to understand what was happening here, why it was happening, and then we can go on to understand the grapes of San Gimignano. Um, anybody know how many different kinds of beans there are in Italy? Take a guess. 50, 85, 200. Yeah, it's over 500. It's over 500 different kinds of beans in Italy. Why? Because 85% of Italy is mountains, right? How many of you have lived in a small mountain community? Yeah, do you know the people on the other side of the mountain? No. You know the people up the valley, and you know the people down the valley, so every tiny little valley in Italy has its own culture, and that's why there are 500 and some odd kinds of beans. It's also where there, why there are very nearly that many DOCs in Italy. They also have earthquakes, in case you're wondering. <laughs> so they have more than 500, 543 DOCs. Does anyone know how many they will have? I'll give you a hint. There are 645 representatives in the House of Representatives in Italy. <laughs> Everybody's going to have their own. Sooner or later, they're all going to have their own. So let's talk a little bit about San Gimignano. Here's Italy. Again, if to understand Italy, you have to understand that the Mediterranean is the sea in the middle of the earth. Mediterranean actually means middle of the earth. It's the sea in the middle of the earth. And the lightning rod, the exclamation point that sticks right down in the middle 
of the sea in the middle of the earth is Italy. Every single current, every single cultural wind that blew across that ocean at one point or another hit Italy. From the Phoenicians to the Greeks to clearly the Romans, clearly the, the um, Arabs, the Normans. There are Norman castles in Sicily. The first king of Sicily was called Roger II. How Italian. His father was Roger, so he's Roger II. But his father couldn't be king of Italy, Sicily because Roger, who would be the first, wasn't born in Sicily. So the first king of Sicily was Roger II. See what you miss if you don't take a good history class. There is Tuscany, and within Tuscany, really almost in the heart, just a little bit west of the heart, is San Gimignano. Tiny little town that originally, of course, all of these hill towns in Tuscany were built on hills to protect themselves so that they could see what was coming. And then, as Italy broke down into factions, which happened almost immediately after the fall of Rome, um, the factions were not only in different parts of Italy, but literally different parts of the same town. So just as you may remember from your Shakespeare, the Montagues and the Capulets in the same town fighting each other to the death, you had the Ghibellines and the Guelphs, the, the, the Holy Roman supporters of the Holy Roman Emperor against the Pope. You had all of these factions constantly, constantly fighting. The Medici, the Borgias. Yeah, good stuff, huh? They should write more novels about this. Uh, perfect Mediterranean climate for grapes, good ventilation, not much fog, so you're not going to grow much nebbiolo here. Altitude, that's what gives a little crispness to these wines, although you will discover in the whites that as much as crispness, I'm not saying Christmas, crispness, there is also some phenolic content, a little bit of skin contact that gives a little structure to the wines. I love this word. How many of you have walked into a wine shop and said, yes, do you have any wines from tufaceous soils? <laughs> I think that's a wor worth a shot. I think if you walk into your wine shop or your local restaurant, and you know the really hip young, young Psalm, you know, with a couple of tats and a couple of piercings and the tiny little facial hair and all, and he comes over, yeah, 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 yeah. yes, do you have any tufaceous wines? <laughs> I think that will just sit him right back on his rear end and you are... <laughs> I think you, at that point, you're going to get a whole different level of service. <laughs> yep. That is uh, the central piazza. Notice the well, because even on the top of the hill, you need a well. Why do you need a well on the top of the hill? Well, you need water, but why, why wouldn't you just bring water from someplace else? Because in times of siege, when... Whoever was on the wrong side of you was outside of you. You needed a place to get water even when they'd cut you off from the rest of the world for six or eight months. So every one of these towns has a little well. The one in Montepulciano, which we'll see in the next presentation, equally entertaining. A white wine of regal color. Is that not a great... No, you tend to think of regal wines as red wines, although I love the story that Charlemagne replanted part of Corton, the part we call Corton Charlemagne, because his wife complained that his white beard was getting stained by the red wine, and would he please drink some white wine as the evening went on? My wife just bought me a bib, so... <laughs> But listen to the people who drank Bernaccia when it was at the peak of its fame. Dante, Boccaccio, Deschamps, Geoffrey Chaucer. Those are some pretty big names in the world of the Middle Ages, huh? Yeah. Beautiful city. And then in the 17th century, the Grand Dukes, the Medici. Of course, remember Catherine of Medici got married to the King of France and was so appalled at the state of culture in France that she sent back to Italy and insisted that they send her artists, chefs, and forks. 
because the French were not eating with forks yet, she was, because the chefs in France couldn't cook. This is something the Italians like pointing out to the chefs of France today. <laughs> And because Leonardo da Vinci, well, frankly, France didn't have anybody as good as that, and neither did anyone else in the whole world. Um, by the way, the proper technique for eating when you don't have a fork and you are eating a piece of beef like we saw last night, <laughs> you are supposed to grab a large chunk of the roast, hold it up to your face, and bite. Then take the knife and cut that portion off so that, in fact, only the knife and your hand touches the meat. You then, once you do that, can put that piece on your plate and chew it up. That's high, fine, fine dining before Catherine de' Medici got to France. Yes, yes. There are certainly men in the crowd who think, you know, that doesn't sound that bad, actually. Yeah. And then, of course, you've got the great artists. Um, Giorgio Vasari painted in the Palazzo, the, uh, Palazzo Vecchio of Florence, the fabulous city hall of Florence, a young satyr who is drinking vernaccia. And Michelangelo wrote, I mean, not only was he the greatest architect, the greatest inventor, and the greatest artist of all time, he could write poetry. Slightly sweet kisses and licks, slightly astringent bites, with fresh acidity, pinches, and stings. I don't know her name, but I want to meet her. <laughs> That's a scene of the rolling hillsides taken from the towers of San Gimignano. Yeah, that's what it looks like more or less today because that's right about the right season. Pretty spectacular place. Unfortunately, 18th and 19th centuries in Italy, of course, it was chaos. Um, but in the 1930s, things started to be rebuilt. It was the first Italian wine to remain, to, to, to get the denominazione, the origine controllata, the first DOC wine. And in 72, the first consortio was formed. So primarily Vernaccia, the local grape. You're allowed 15% of non-aromatic white grapes and 10% of what are so-called the international varieties, Sauvignon Blanc and Riesling. I'm not going to get into the rest of it because it's boring. So here are our three wines. The first is a Canetta 2013 Vernaccia di San Gimignano. Now, a note about pronouncing Italian names. Everyone in America seems to think that if you speak Italian, you should speak very quickly. That's how they know you speak Italian. Not true. Think of Italian as an opera. You need to allow the syllables to roll off your tongue. Vernaccia di San Gimignano. Okay, repeat after me. Vernaccia di San Gimignano. See, this is beautiful stuff. I was eating recently, a year or so ago, with a, my daughter who lives in New York and a young friend of hers. And I took them to a nice Italian restaurant and my, the daughter's friend had really never, um, I think, eaten uh, m much in the way of ethnic food. And she, I don't remember what she ordered, but maybe she ordered bruschetta, but she asked the waiter, could she have some bruschetta? And the waiter says, signorina, e bruschetta. Okay, I'm thinking, cute, we'll move on. He's young, they're young, everybody's having fun. My daughter orders something, and he corrects her pronunciation as well. And I said to myself, that's one too many times. <laughs> so the next thing, I order my food, and then he said, would you like wine? And I said, yes, I'd like the Poliziano uh, Vino Noble de Montepulciano. And he looks at me, and I said, it's 37 on your wine list. <laughs> and he didn't correct anybody's pronunciation for the rest of the dinner. Yeah. Yeah. So, Canetta 2013, Vernaccia de San Gimignano. First of all, color. You'll notice that Vernaccia is not the absolutely almost colorless style of wine that you might see in a very young Riesling or maybe a very young Sauvignon Blanc from New Zealand. You're going to get a little more color here. In the nose, please, someone tell me you get plums, cassis, and dark berries. 
just to throw a curveball here, right? No, it's that, you know, you're going to smell what everybody always smells. <laughs> Keith says cassis, God bless him. Apples, pears, yeah, you know the story, right? That if you look at a white wine, they all smell like apples, pears, melons, and white flowers. Now, I have an issue with white flowers. Are we talking geraniums or gardenias? Don't tell me something smells like white flowers, right? So, although I once asked one of my classes, what kind of apples would you use to describe this wine? And one guy in the back who did not like the wine said, road apples. <laughs> What do you think? Fresh, lively, crisp. Kinds of surprises you, kind of surprises you because in the nose, slightly floral. In the mouth, you get that nice roundness. And then the finish is zing. It almost makes you want to reach for one more calamari, doesn't it? And then when you have the calamari, you think, well, that was just a little oily. Maybe I'll have a little more wine. And then you think, well, you know, maybe I'll just have one more calamari. And you can go on like that for a really long time. <laughs> yeah, perfect wine for this. Just lovely. Yeah, no, there's, uh, to be fair, this is not a wine that's made with extensive batonnage and all the rest of that. This is a wine that's pretty much made in very, very straightforward techniques. Yep. Mm. Okay, so I'll show you the bottle so you know what it looks like. Podere caneta. Podere means farm or vineyard. Um, and it has a huge, really monstrous sort of oak-looking tree on the label. Green, which I always think is a good idea for white wine. It makes people think they're refreshing. Cool. So we're going to vote. I'm just warning you now. We're going to vote on these wines, the three whites, the three reds. So start reviewing the candidate statements. Checking their backgrounds. Um, good question on the price. All of these wines sell for between fifteen and twenty-five dollars a bottle. Okay. I don't know. Okay. Well, here, yeah, this is. We get to play one of my favorite games. So, if you think it matters, you should be able to tell me. And if you don't think it matters, I don't need to answer the question. <laughs> Here we go. That's right. I'm running for, yeah. What's alcohol level? Yeah, well, okay. The, 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 I, I, you were, first of all, you're all correct. You're all correct because as long as you're under 14% alcohol, as long as you're with 1.5% of the actual alcohol, you're legal. And the alcohol on this bottle says 12.5, which means it legally has to be somewhere between 11 and 14, and that's where all you guessed. So you're all right, you give a gold star, and you're good to go. Or maybe it doesn't matter. Or maybe it doesn't matter. Okay, next one is the Falcini uh, Vinea Donne. So remember what I said about the last wine? Beautiful green package, makes you think light and refreshing. This wine in some ways makes you think, red. Red. well, you think it's red, except that it's actually a really cool um, uh, medieval tapestry of two very attractive young women carrying baskets of grapes on their heads during the harvest. So as far as I'm concerned, that's, you get that. That's free. Free pass any time you can show people doing the harvest, and we all know that when you harvest grapes, you get up in the morning, you pick the grapes, at lunchtime, you stop, 
the family brings out an enormous pasta feast, the uncle plays accordion, the attractive young girls dance with the attractive young guys, and this goes on late into the evening, and the next morning we do it all over again. It's exactly the way we pick grapes in Napa. (laughs) If any of you tell people that that's not true, we have to hunt you down and kill you because that is why people buy wine. They buy wine because of that wonderful image of what the harvest is like and how much of a celebration of life it is. And this bottle has that celebration right on the label. And one part of it's really particularly charming. One of the two young women is holding the basket of grapes over her head. And and juice is dripping out of the basket (laughs) into her open mouth. Let's try this wine. Casale Falchini. Okay. What do you think of the nose? There's a little muscat to it. There's a little, and there's also to me a little bit of a, a, a green herb, a tarragon or a dill in it as well, a little bit. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You'd have to tell me that. <laughs> it's a little savory herb. And is this, if, if the first one is 2% milk, is this whole milk or skim milk? It's whole milk. This is a little fatter, a little richer, a little riper. Not quite so much uh, acidity in the finish either. So whereas the first one would have been perfect for calamari, This one might be better, given the herbal note we picked up on the other things, maybe a Mediterranean chicken with a little green olive and rosemary with the roast chicken. When is lunch? (laughs) You know, we have a problem. We always, I do a radio show uh, recorded at Capital Public Radio in Sacramento, and it's a podcast. You can listen to it, rickandpaulwine.com. And we always record at 11 on Tuesday mornings. And the last thing we do in the show is a food and wine pairing. And it's excruciating. We're starving. And Rick says, so what would you serve with? And I'm thinking, man, right now, I would eat anything. (laughs) (laughs) So yeah, it's it's a lot of fun to listen to the show. But boy, do we get hungry. Um, Okay, there's candidate number two. Now let's go on to candidate number three, which is the Casa Lucci. Not Lucy, but Lucci. Mare Terra Reserva, not named for Lucille Ball. <laughs> Although this morning at breakfast, we were talking about the famous scene, the harvest scene with Lucille Ball. I'm sorry, you know what? There are very few people in the world who have that kind of talent. That's pretty great stuff. Notice that this is a year older. Mm. Yummy, 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 huh? So in terms of body, about the same as the last one, maybe? A little lighter, a little heavier? A little lighter. Yeah. Even though it's a year older, you would expect the acidity to die back with age. The acidity on this wine carries through very nicely. Yummy, huh? To me, this wine, especially being a 2012, the reason we're enjoying it is it is so perfectly balanced. There's just nothing that jumps out at you. It's just all perfectly there. So, you ready to vote? You get as many as you'd like. (laughs) Only one arm at a time, though. Okay, how many vote for the Canetta, the first wine? Canetta 2013. Okay. And for the uh, Casa Falchini, okay. And for the Casa Lucci, okay. The results are, it looks like they were sort of in in order, 
more people preferred the Casalucci than the Casale Falchini, and finally the Canetta. The thing that I would like to point out is within this group of quite knowledgeable wine drinkers, each of these wines had its fans. One of the problems with using scores to evaluate wines is scores only encapsulate a single person at a single point in time. And a good sommelier would have at least two of these wines so that they can give you an option depending on which you would prefer. Um, because ultimately, the person who's right is you, not that sommelier. Yeah, yeah. So this is what Vernaccio looks like. This is what they tell you it tastes like. I love dry, harmonious, and savory. <laughs> Although, to be fair, one of the things we noted about wine number two, there was a savory element in that. Yep. When is lunch? <laughs> yeah, those little zucchini flowers. And then, of course, it's Italy. What does it go with? Ah, you have to talk to my mama. She makes... No, we don't have to talk to him. It goes with everything. It's amazing with white meats, with or without sauces. Anyway, okay. A nice risotto. And I'm going to blow through this. I did want to show you this as we wrap up the San Gimignano part of our tour of Tuscany. This is where the consortio meets. The frescoes are from the 14 and 1500s. You'd have to assume, walking into that room, that there's a certain gravitas that takes over. Probably not that much backslapping as they go in to do the official tastings and official proceedings of the Consortio de San Gimignano. Cool. That's San Gimignano. So far, so good. Now, um, enjoy those wines a little more while I set up the next PowerPoint question. Well, they are the actual producers of, of, yeah, they're the producers of Vernaccia de San Gimignano. Well, in this case, it looks like they're just doing a general tasting, but as you know, for any DOC and DOCG, there is a panel that basically sets standards for, for the wines of the region, so, yeah. We're now leaving Vernaccia de San Gimignano. And we are going to Vino Nobile di Montepulciano. Okay? It's opera. You ready? Vino Nobile di Montepulciano. Beautiful. Oh. Where's Placido Domingo when you need him? Actually, for Italian, it should be. Yeah. Pavarotti. Here is Welcome to Montepulciano. I want you to fully appreciate the photo in the lower right. This is a medieval festival. Lower left, I'm sorry. You are correct. I wasn't going there. What are they doing? They are rolling, and those are not your normal little Burg um, Burgundian Bordelais 225 liter barrels. These are 350 liter barrels that they are rolling right up the steepest hill all the way to the top of Montepulciano. You know how in Siena they have the palio where the various communities race against each other in the horse race? In Montepulciano, there are no horses involved. This is the way the different regions in the town, the different families, and did I mention that we're in Italy? Even today, every little church has its own organization that enters the race, and they push these barrels up the hill. And it's about, it's about half a mile. So if you think for the first 50 feet this isn't too bad, you're in for a surprise. It gets steeper and steeper, and a half a mile is a long way to push a wine barrel. They go up in teams, and everyone's wearing their medieval costume. It's really quite a show. Here we are. Um, do you remember where? Um, do you remember where San Gimignano is? This is a smaller map. This isn't all of Tuscany. So San Gimignano is about two hundred feet away. It's just off the map. This is south of Florence, okay. just outside of Perugia. Again, a wine region that has fabulous 
fabulous connections with the world, including you may recognize the gentleman on the right. He was at our uh, tasting a <laughs> couple nights ago. Um, Voltaire, Thomas Jefferson, if you're going to have someone like your wine, if you start with Voltaire and Thomas Jefferson, you are going to be in fine shape. By the way, for those of you who don't know, Thomas Jefferson was the president who supervised the construction of the White House, right? As wine people, you should know that he delayed construction for a year and a half because the initial plans showed a wine cellar that wasn't nearly large enough. And he insisted that they redesign the plans of the White House so that they could expand the wine cellar to have a cellar of the size he thought appropriate for the President of the United States. I knew there was a reason we liked this man. <laughs> oh, yeah. And of course, the man in the middle, the Count of Monte Cristo and the three musketeers, Alexandre Dumas. That's a great little list there, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, so they make different wines in Montepulciano. We will taste one Vino Nobile de Montepulciano and we'll taste two wines from their neighbors produced by wineries in Montepulciano. We'll taste a Colosinese. Anyone know what that means, by the way? Coli kills. Sinese from, Flor uh, from, from Florence, from Siena. So Colosinese means from the hills of Siena. And then we'll taste a Chianti DOCG, a basic Chianti. Here's the production zone. This is really quite funny because um, the total of Vino Nobile de Montepulciano is 3,200 hectares. The Napa Valley, which we consider to be small, 4% of the wine from California comes from the Napa Valley. Uh, the Napa Valley is about um, 12 to 14 times this large. If you took the subregion of Rutherford, it's about 60% larger than Montepulciano. This is a tiny little region on this one little hilltop. And of course, there's only one reason this town was so important. Um, notice the map. What's at the top of the map? Florence. And at the bottom? Rome. Who was in charge in Rome? Pope. Who was in charge in Florence? The Medici. They were not friends. And Montepulciano was a watchtower. The entire town was a guard station for the Medici to let them know when the Pope might decide to do something, let's say, a little more aggressive than perhaps our current Pope would um, undertake. I don't think he's ready to invade Florence yet. So. Obviously, the primary grape is Sangiovese, which I think is a wonderful grape. One of the theories is that the name comes from Sangre Jove, which means the blood of Jove. You know, if you're going to drink a red wine, you ought to drink the blood of the king of gods. Yeah. And then Colorino, Canaiolo, Colorino, intense, deep, black, not particularly aromatic. It's the Petit Syrah of Italian grapes. And the Canaiolo, actually a little more perfumey, a little more uh, Cabernet Franc style. So the two of those add a little something, particularly the, the Colorino adds something because Sangiovese is often a, a rather delicately flavored wine. Normal needs two years of aging. Reserve is three years of aging. There will not be an exam. You don't need to remember this stuff. And as I said in, at my lecture at lunch the other day, if you do need to know it, you can look it up on your phone in 15 seconds. Yeah. The Consortio, back to 1965, 75 wineries. Here are some of the things they do. In fact, that tasting in the lower left is one that we organized for them in San Francisco. There's that famous barrel race. The plaza of Montepulciano <laughs> is quite spectacular. You will notice uh, what you're seeing here, the photograph in the lower left is the plaza, and it was taken from the top of the tower. Now, um, I don't believe there's anyone in this room who will recognize the reference, but this is the town featured in the series of films called Twilight. 
you can ask your grandchildren what they were about. Um, it is apparently now true that large numbers of teenage girls have started pilgrimages to Monte Pulciano because they want to see the tower, which was modeled on the Medici Tower in the Palazzo Vecchio. But, and of course, the people in San, in, in Monte Pulciano tell the wonderful story of all the teenage girls want to come and see where what's her name was chased by then. She ran down. And then they point out that it would be impossible in Monte Pulciano to have this. Because when she leaves the city hall, she would have to turn left. And yet in the movie, she turns right. And so instead of going downhill, she's now headed towards the cathedral. And none of this works in Monte Pulciano. <laughs> I had to explain to them that Hollywood does take liberties from time to time in a story. You had a question, sir. No, that's a really good question. Those are empty barrels. Yeah, yeah because it's, it is a wonderfully exciting and entertaining race, but it is not a race to the death. And full barrels, if they, if you, because every once in a while one of these barrels slows down and starts to roll the other way, and a full barrel rolling the other way, that would be an exciting little bit of local folklore there. <laughs> yeah. So we're going to start with wine number four. This is the Poderi Arcangelo, the, arch, the archangel. Chianti Colosinesi, 2011. So a Chianti from the hills of Siena, classic Sangiovese. What are your first clues that this is a Sangiovese wine? First of all is color. Sangiovese doesn't have a deep red color. It has a brick color. It's one of the, again, one of the few wines that sort of falls outside the normal spectrum, although it's certainly garnet, but it's always a pale garnet. And I can always tell if you even add 5 to 10% of Merlot or Cabernet to Sangiovese, it immediately turns the wine a darker sort of bluer red. And, and particularly from what I can see up against the carpet in this room, the uh, wine number six, that's really classic Sangiovese color. You know, again, not completely saturated, relicately, uh, relatively delicate in color. And then in the nose, what do you expect from Sangiovese? pepper, leather, sour cherry. And in the mouth, the one thing you'll find in Sangiovese that you won't find in any California wine, that level of acidity. Sangiovese has acid. And again, as we were talking about in my previous seminar, we were talking about Malbec and Asado. The classic dish with red wine in Tuscany Who said bistecca? Bistecca alla Fiorentina. Exactly right. This is a chunk of beef. The last time I had it was about a year ago in Tuscany. There were three of us, and they presented us two options. One was 1.6 kilos, and one was 1.8 kilos. Kilos, 2.2 pounds. So they were presenting us somewhere between three and a half and four pounds of meat for three people. Um, and it is cooked relatively, uh, it's not cooked very much. And it is served on a big, heavy metal tray that's red hot. So that you eat the part that has just been cooked, and while you're eating, you turn and line the thing up so that you're always getting something literally hot off the grill. Did I mention that the young woman who was hosting us then announced after we'd ordered the meat that she actually wouldn't be having any? <laughs> yeah. You have a corked one over there. Um, uh, this must be number four. Okay, so we actually have an extra bottle of these wines in the back. Okay, now you know what we say when somebody gets a bad bottle of wine, right? Oh, it was the best wine we ever had. We'll get you a new one. Yeah, just letting you know you missed something. Yeah. So imagine, yes. 
I'm so, I did not eat it all. No, one of the things that I have learned as I, um, as I advance in years is that I do not have to clean my plate the way my mother taught me. <laughs> the first course, of course, was pasta. Uh, I actually don't remember. The... Yeah, of course. Um, it, it is interesting because when you often ask people in America what they would drink a Chianti with, the normal answer in any Italian restaurant is pasta, right? I don't know if you saw the recent study by Cornell University. They did a survey and they gave ver consumers a list of a hundred different words that appear on a wine label. And they said, which of these words would make you more willing to purchase this wine or more attracted to this wine? And which of these words would send you scurrying for cover? The word that the American consumer picked as the least attractive word on a bottle of wine? Pasta. <laughs> Apparently, consumers interpret a wine that goes with pasta to mean bad wine. I can only imagine what every Italian must feel, not only in their stomach, but in their heart as they hear this. Because, yeah, absolutely the essence of every Italian. Uh, top parts were things like elegance and concentration, ripe, powerful, deep. Yeah. 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 And, and free is also very good, yes. Um, the other word that they hated was crisp, which clearly shows why you people are not the American consumer. Because most of you, given an opportunity to taste a crisp white wine, would say, I'm in. And the average American consumer says, no, 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 sounds sour. So it just goes to show that as we teach and we interact with people about wine, we need to be aware of the fact that most of them don't really understand and use the same words we do, and it's probably more our fault than theirs. So. You mean the bottle or the wine? <laughs> well, actually, there's a good story, because you know what that bottle is called? It's called a fiasco. <laughs> it means, in Italian, a flask. But the Murano glass blowers outside of Venice would pull out a lump of molten glass to make one of their fantastic sculptures. And they would work on a piece of glass, and if they could not get the glass to behave, they would work this, they would work, and they finally would say, eh, the way Italians do. Eh, I'm just going to make a bottle. And they would say, eh, è un fiasco. And that is where we get the use of the term fiasco as a disaster. It's a piece of glass that the only thing you could really do is make a damn bottle out of it. Uh, actually, um, not completely. In fact, one of them we actually had to send to Italy and ask them to send some bottles directly to us. Um, but these came out of, remember our story about how we got the Bordeaux's? Well, my company organized a tasting of Vernaccia de San Gimignano and also Vino Nobile de Montepulciano. And in those cases, we had some wines left over and we were able to assemble lots of wines that we thought would be interesting to you. And then we added them all up and said, we're short four bottles. And we called the president of the Consorcio of Vernaccia de San Gimignano, who's a friend of mine, and we said, Stefano, we need four more bottles. And he sent them. So that's how we got the ones. Yeah. OK. Wine number five. This is Chianti, D-O-C-G. D-O-C-G means? Denominazione de origine controllata e garantita. 
Why is it guaranteed? What does it mean that it is guaranteed? It's not only a specific region. Even what used to be called an IGT wine comes from a specific region. DOC from a smaller region, so you're correct there. But the garantita actually means that there is a bl panel of blind tasters composed of winemakers, sommeliers, etc., who have been certified by the consortio. And every wine that has DOCG on the label has been tasted by this panel and guaranteed to be a good and typical example of the region. I'm sure they're doing this in Virginia. <laughs> well, they're not doing it in Napa, so I can't imagine they're doing it anywhere else. The idea of a bunch of American producers submitting their wines to an independent panel and being told, if you don't pass the test, you can't call it Napa Valley wine. I can only imagine the egos that would get bruised in that particular battle. So this is Chianti DOCG. Remember that Chianti is not Chianti Classico. Chianti Classico is a separate region inside of the larger region of Chianti, and you cannot make Chianti in Chianti Classico, and you cannot make Chianti Classico in Chianti. They have different rules, different grapes, the whole thing. Also Sangiovese, but what a difference. More aromatic, no? I love the name of the company, too. Geografico, no? Mm. Uh, this is one that is available in the U.S. Uh, this is about uh, $18, I think. Yeah, it's pretty nice wine, huh? Yeah. And what I love about it, again, it's Sangiovese. And what's the kicker every time you can look at it? There are a couple of different wines that may have this paler color. The kicker for Sangiovese is always if it's got that kind of acidity. And this wine is mouth-watering. This wine, after it's in your mouth, whether you spit or swallow, the next thing your mouth does is say, mm -hmm. <laughs> mouth-watering acidity, just delicious with food. Yeah. Okay, the last of our wines today is the Tenut di Graziano della Setta. See, it's opera. Vino nobile di Montepulciano. Now, I visited Montepulciano, really one of the most memorable visits to a wine region I've ever done. We arrived, it was pouring rain, and we were told that we had basically two jobs. We had to meet with the mayor of Montepulciano, and then we had to go downstairs in the cellars. The office of the Consortio de Vino Nobile de Montepulciano is actually in a cellar underneath the main piazza of the town. So we had to go down in the cellar, and there were 40 producers of Vino Nobile de Montepulciano who wanted to participate in this tour we were organizing in the U.S., and we had to pick 12 which seemed like a good idea until we realized that we were having dinner with a group of them later. Some of them would not have been selected. <laughs> At one point as we arrived for dinner, I noticed a huge amount of firewood outside, and I said, is that for the dinner or for us? <laughs> so we went in to meet the mayor. And if you ha how many of you have seen a Twilight? Have you seen anyone seen the Twilight? Yeah, I kind of guess. It's not the right demographics for Twilight. But anyway... That wonderful old ta tall tower that's in Montepulciano, well, that, that's the mayor's office. You walk in, and it's marble staircases. It was built by the Medici. So the city hall is this palace that you walk in, and it's very, to me, it was very funny. You walk in this beautiful marble palace, and on the marble walls, there are classic paintings, and over in one section, they have all those official government posters you have to put up about, you know, equal opportunity and OSHA and all the rest, pasted to the marble walls. And we went up to the first floor, which was where the mayor had his offices. And we arrived, and there were four gentlemen ranging from 45 to about 75 or 80, and they were waiting for us. 
And we walked in and they came over and we all started chatting and they explained that they were the consiglieri. They were the cabinet. They were the advisors to the mayor. Or as we would say in this country, his posse. <laughs> the mayor was unaccountably detained. He was on an important phone call. You could see him in his office. He was chattering. <laughs> but they would be happy to make small talk with us for a while until the mayor became available. And I began to realize this is pure theater. You know? There is a ritual here, and we have just been invited to participate in the ritual. I was delighted. Okay, so we chatted about the weather, we chatted about how beautiful the city is, blah, blah, blah. And at some point, we had waited long enough. Because then one of the consigliere said, ah, I believe his honor is available now. And the mayor came out, shook all of our hands, and invited us to sit around a huge table in his inner office. And so we sat down. And the mayor made a speech in Italian. He made a speech about how wonderful it was to have such distinguished visitors. Mm -hmm. And then he explained how important wine was as an ambassador of Italian culture, and particularly of Montepulciano, and he was there, and he gave a wonderful speech. And there was a translator who translated the speech, and then there was silence, and I realized, it's my turn. So I made a speech about how wonderful Montepulciano was and how beautiful the vineyards were and what lovely people and blah, blah, blah. And he thanked me very much. And then one of his consiglieri made a speech. I turned to the guy on the right and I said, say something. <laughs> it was like watching a volleyball game. Huh? <laughs> only there were five of them and only three of us. But it's okay because two of them, when the mayor said, Giovanni, do you want to say something? Giovanni said, no, 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 I think everything has been said already. So we finished up. This had now taken 45 minutes. It was a lovely visit with the mayor. He then stood up and presented us each with an illustrated, hand-printed history of the coats of arms of Montepulciano in Italian. I don't know what to do with this. It was a really heavy book. It was the kind of book airlines don't like. He presented the book. We all thanked him effusively for, what, for a fabulous gift. He walked us to the edge of the stairs. He went back in his office, and the consigliere escorted us down to street level. And that was my audience with the mayor of Monte. Now, I should point out, Montepulciano has 4,000 inhabitants. Okay. This was not Washington, D.C. or even Richmond, Virginia. This was a town so small that most towns in, Napa, in California, if they had a city hall, the mayor wouldn't have his own office. He'd share it with the city manager or something, right? <laughs> not in Italy. It was a thing of beauty. We went down. It was pouring rain. We sprinted across the piazza. We ran downstairs, and we tasted through the wines. We argued. We fought. We tasted. We argued. We came up with 12 wines. By then it was late in the day, and we walked back out up to the piazza, and just the, the sky was still completely overcast. But right over the, the Mediterranean, right on the horizon, there was just a break about the size of the sun, and the sunlight was just streaming through. And the entire piazza was bathed in this sort of rosy glow. And I turned to the president of the consortio, and I said, See what happens when you drink Vino Nobile de Montepulciano. <laughs> so the last wine is Vino Nobile de Montepulciano. Yours is Court. We have another bottle of this one too. Number six. Hmm. So, while they're getting wine number six, who has the corked wine? Just a couple people here in the middle row, okay? It's not corked.
welcome to try another bottle, but I'm not getting cork out of that. So, how would you compare this to the previous two wines? Uh, elegant? Uh, more complex to me. There's just, although Jackie would say not all of what's going on, it is something she likes. But more complex, a lot of different things going on here. Right here, right there. The row two, row two. Okay, are you ready to vote? You are ready to vote on the red wines from Tuscany? We need to wait because um, there are some hanging chads in row two. What you can see in the slide here, by the way. OK, good. They got, a, they got a better bottle now. What you can see in the slides here is the well in the central piazza. In the background, in the back right, you can see the tower that was in twilight, the tower built by the Medici. It actually is much taller than that. This camera angle sort of makes it look shorter. And then in the upper left, you see the famous logo of the Medici. Now, the Medici were doctors, but their logo, as they sought to control the world and finance the world, were the seven, well, six balls. Does anyone know what those stood for? Anyone astronomical in the crowd? To the ancients, there was one thing in the sky that moved that was hot, and everything else was cold. Or in other words, there were six moving objects plus the sun. The six moving objects were the moon, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. And they all revolved around the Earth in those days. That was the theory. And the Medici believed that the world should revolve around them. So the six balls symbolize the, the orbits of the planets around the center of the universe, which was Florence and the Medici. Yep. Uh, they've recently restored this. And by the way, that rather plain looking building behind the well on the left, anyone know what that is? That is the Cathedral of Montepulciano. If you want to know whether the Pope or the Medici ruled in this part of town, it's pretty clear who ruled, right? Because the city hall got finished in marble, and the church, we just never got around to finishing the facade. <laughs> Sorry, Pope, maybe next time. They are now restoring. There's an old fortress on the top of the hill. It's particularly charming because the marketing director of the consortio, who has worked in my office for a few months, a dear friend of ours, Silvia Loriga, uh, she was telling me that they are in the process of funding a complete restoration of this old fortress building. She said, I remember it well because I went to junior high school in that building. <laughs> and now they're, re they're going to restore it and turn it into a museum because the kids actually deserve a better place to go to school than the old fortress in jail. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, they have got some great press recently. Spectator. This is a fabulous little church just underneath the hills of Montepulciano. It is time to visit Montepulciano. There you see the church below, the hilltop above. There you get a sense of that tower that stands out above everything, overlooking all of Tuscany and letting the Medici know whether the Pope was on his way or not. What do you think of the three wines? Are you ready to vote? How many would vote for the first wine? Okay. How many would vote for the second wine? How many would vote for the third wine? Okay, we have a victor. The Vino Nobile de Montepulciano was the most popular of the three red wines, clearly. Um, I hope it gave you a sense of how the wines are different. 
Colisinese, relatively lighter, brighter, simpler wine. The Chianti, a little more concentrated, a little richer, but no, still not, let's say, complex. And then ultimately the Vino Nobile de Montepulciano, deep, rich, complex, elegant. I hope you enjoyed the seminar. I hope you visit San Gimignano and Montepulciano. Thank you.